relationship that I received a few years ago pre-COVID um, and have been working a bit on this new project on the long-term impacts of the Vietnam War. Um, and part of that interest in this new project was because when I published this book um, a while ago now, a lot of people said, why didn't you have more about the war? Why wasn't there more about the war? And I particularly didn't want to focus on the war because I was um, very much um, part of the group of people that wanted to show Vietnam as more than a war. And so the first book basically has a page <laughs> about the war. Um, and I realized I needed to do more. Um, and so that's the new project, is to think about all of the different environmental consequences of um, both the war itself, but then after, uh, the, 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 particularly the, the immediate post-war period from about 1975 to early 1990s, because that was a really fundamental time um, for Vietnam to be thinking about ecological restoration and different projects um, to try to deal with wartime consequences. And there's been a lot of work on Agent Orange in particular. That's been the focus of a lot of development projects and, and books and so forth. This new project I'm working on, I'm hopeful, is going to be more about more than Agent Orange. Um, there's a lot of other consequences of the war that weren't didn't get as much attention. For example, I've just finished a chapter on maritime consequences, consequences for marine um, species, some species extinctions, marine pollution issues, um, coastline erosion issues that are all a direct consequence of the war. Um, and so my hope is once I get this book done, which won't, won't be for another couple of years, but it'll have a, a, a sort of broader um, scope of thinking about wartime impacts and then the, the, the long history of restoration since then. Um, but right now, because I wasn't ready to talk about that book in particular, because I'm still working on it, I was happy to come and talk about um, Forests Are Gold, which came out in 2016. And I actually have a copy of the book to donate to Fulbright uh, for the library, so if anybody wants it. And then for everybody else, I just have these little postcards, so you can grab one of those and, and have my name and, and the information if you're interested. Um, and I wrote this book, Forests Are Gold, because I, I was really struck by a very simple question, which is why does environmental policy in Vietnam and Southeast Asia generally um, often fail? We have a lot of money that's going towards the environment. We have a lot of people talking about how the protection of the environment is important, and yet we sort of continually have failures of environmental policy. Pollution is growing, carbon emissions are growing, um, forests are becoming more degraded. And so I really took that very simple question, why does it fail? Um, and then I realized maybe I was asking the wrong question. Maybe I, I was assuming that there was such a thing as environmental policy, that is a policy focused on environmental issues um, but maybe that was the wrong question to ask because maybe a lot of the policies that were labeled as environmental weren't actually about the environment at all. And that was the reason why they failed. And so that's, that's the sort of thesis that I developed in the book. Um, and so I argued in the book that, it's, that environmental policy is often not actually about nature or ecology. It's often about people. Um, and so the policies and actions that a lot of governments, Vietnam and elsewhere, take, um, they often are labeled as environmental, um, but they're about other societal goals. So things like supplies of natural resources for markets, the movement and control of people, particularly in sensitive ecosystems like mountainous ecosystems. Um, sometimes the policies are about labor and employment. Um, sometimes they're about cultural practices. They're about turning um, people who might be culturally different into something else. Um, and so there are all these sort of ulterior motives, these underlying motives for environmental policy um, that don't always um, uh, appear right in the label of the policy itself. Great, thank you so much.
Um, so if we ignore the fact that a lot of things that are called environmental policy actually have these underlying motives, we might be looking at the wrong things. And so that's the point of the book. And I look specifically about forest policy, but I think you can analyze any type of policy from this, this framing. Um, and so Forest Circle really thinks about forest policy as being not really about conservation of forests, but really about seeing and managing people. And so it's that strategy that I called environmental rule that's in the title of the book. So um, next slide, please. So I just want to give a really brief introduction to this concept of environmental rule, and I'll talk a little bit about how I used it in the book itself, but also give you an example that isn't in the book, but um, something I've been working on since then, and that's climate adaptation policy. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what environmental rule is, what I mean by it. Um, and one of the things that I was asked about a lot once the book came out was, you know, does this, does this only apply to Vietnam or does it apply to other places? Um, and I think the answer is it applies a lot of other places. And folks who have worked in other parts of the world have told me that it's a useful framing, which, which has been really great um, to hear. So environmental rule really, as I said, uses environmental or ecological reasons as a justification for what is really a concern with social planning, with dealing with where people are located in the landscape, what they're doing in the landscape, and so forth. So it's really about people and not about the landscape itself. And so as a result, um, environmental policies, actually, yeah, go back one second. There we go. Um, environmental policies um, often have as a justification, you know, improvement, protection of the environment, but in reality, it's actually improvement of people that's at the heart of some of the policies. So to give an example, a policy on watersheds, how to protect watersheds, might actually really be about resettling ethnic minorities to be closer to um, development centers. Um, a policy on restricting timber sales might really be about controlling revenue for a state bureaucracy. Um, and so what these different approaches to environmental rule have in common, they can occur in lots of different places, but what they have in common is this idea that it's really society that they're aimed at, even though they're called environmental policies. Um, so just to be clear about what I mean by rule, rule comes from Foucault. Um, and he really talks a lot about, uh, about rule being trying to get people to do what you want them to do. And so it makes sense that a lot of these environmental policies are about changing people's behavior, their conduct, their cultural practices, their ideas. Um, and so these policies often take many different forms. And in my book, I talk about a lot of the different types of policies. But what they have in common is that it's actually society that's the target, not the environment itself. So the environment becomes an excuse. So next slide, please. So one way to think about these is this idea of like Potemkin policy. So Potemkin was the, the Russian um, uh, bureaucrat that worked for Catherine the Great. And um, he, she would often want to know what was going on in other parts of Russia. And he would make these fake villages to take her to and be like, look how beautiful it is, right? Um, and so I like this idea that like, you know, environmental policy has this, this sort of front, this, this facade, that it's about the environment, but if you actually look behind it, there's very little behind it that's about ecology itself. And so it's really just the, the surface layer is about the environment, but really there's much more um, going on behind uh, these policies themselves. So one example I use a lot in the book, um, and I actually have a more recent article that came out in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies last year, I think, 2022, is about shifting agriculture, Sweden agriculture, um, in Vietnamese, um, because that has been a practice that has continually been um, the object of environmental policies, trying to prevent Sweden agriculture, trying to control people who practice Sweden agriculture. And these policies have always relied on ecological um, explanations, like we've got to protect the soil, we've got to protect water, we've got to protect trees. Um, but in nearly all cases, the ecological science under the policies is non-existent. Like nobody ever did a study on soil erosion 
um, as a result of Sweden, you know, for many, many years. But there, there was always a justification. Um, and so the, the social pressures are really the motivations for these policies. Um, so assimilating ethnic minorities into king um, uh, approaches, the way the houses are built, the way the people are settled, um, move them out of economically valuable forests um, that could be used for either tourism or timber. Um, these have been the, the underlying concerns of these so-called environmental policies. So next slide, please. There you go. Um, so environmental rule really comes out of my reading of two bodies of literature. Um, the first is governmentality from Foucault, and the second is really actor network theory um, from Latour and others. Um, and so governmentality is this idea that you know we really need to think about policies not as, as things that governments alone do, um, but as a sort of broad approach to trying to change what he called the conduct of conduct, like how people conduct themselves. Um, and so what Foucault really told us to do was not to look at politics just through governments, but to also think about um, that governance happens through cultural change. It happens through multiple actors, not just in a top-down way. Um, and so it's really about um, figuring out, um, you know, how people are, are determined to be governable. Like, how do we figure out how we govern people and what are the ways we, we do that? Um, and so from actor network theory, I also pulled on this idea that um, oftentimes it's networks themselves that are able to move knowledge around and that knowledge is part of governance, right? It's part of governmentality. And so um, actor network theory talks about how those networks form um, and who's in the networks. It's sometimes not just people, it can be trees themselves or various technologies like maps are part of networks. And so environmental rule is drawing on both of these to provide examples of how those different people in networks are trying to change the conduct of conduct around the natural world and how people draw on different forms of authority to do that. Um, so, you know, this can involve looking at how problems like deforestation even become recognized in the first place. Um, so maybe next slide, please. Yeah, oh, can I do it myself? Yeah, perfect, okay, great. There we go. Um, so the, in the book I argue there's basically five key steps in establishing environmental rule. The first is to figure out what the problem is. And so somebody figures out that um, you know, deforestation is a problem um, because it contributes to soil erosion. Or deforestation is a problem because it, we lose timber revenue for the government. Um, but deforestation isn't a problem in and of itself, right? It has to be defined in relationship to people. Um, and so I argue in the book that turning something to a problem usually takes th three steps. Um, that some component of nature has to be defined as the thing we're gonna intervene in, like, oh, um, I see that lake out there. It looks like it's not totally clear because uh, it's sort of greenish, so it must be polluted. Let's figure out some way to figure out why it's, why it's polluted. So I haven't done any studies. I don't know if it's polluted or not. That could actually be really um, nice algae forming, and it's forming the basis for food webs that are actually really rich. But I've just decided that there's a problem here. I've decided that I don't like the way that lake looks, and so I'm gonna intervene. And that's often, often what happens in landscapes. The intervention is not really based on any sort of ecological study or science. It's just, you know, a, gov a government bureaucrat or an NGO or some local community looks at the environment and says, I don't like the way it looks. Let's make a change. So we have to define where we're gonna intervene. Then the next step is often visualizing what we want the future to look like, and this often involves mapping or models, scenarios about what we think the future environment should look like. Um, and then the last step is to name what change we wanna see. So for the case of forests, the change we wanna see is often turning a landscape that looks like it doesn't have very many trees into a landscape that has a lot of trees. That's the change we wanna see. Um, 
And so those steps are really creating the problem. And then the next step is then to say, okay, you know, how do we then circulate knowledge about this problem that we have then identified? So we might circulate our maps, we might circulate um, some specific types of, of studies that we've done, we might circulate some statistics. Um, you know, deforestation has increased by you know, 30% in the last few years. And so we circulate these types of knowledges around because we're trying to get other people to agree that, oh yeah, this is a problem. And so we use these maps and this data to pull people into our network. Um, so then once we have people who have accepted our problem, they're in our network, we then try to figure out what are we gonna do? What are we gonna intervene in? Um, and a lot of people who work on governmentality have pointed out that policies that are like big policies, top-down policies, are not always the main thing that's going on, um, that there's a lot of um, sort of small steps that are taken in policies and governance. Um, so really small steps could be things like a study of the spatial distribution of species could lead directly to a policy for new nature reserves. So we found these species, that is gonna lead directly to we need to get, kick people out of this area and preserve it. So it could be even like small steps, but they lead to these big potential interventions. And the danger that I point out in environmental rule is that even though we keep talking about the environment, it's actually social interventions that are planned, but we don't do the work to understand those social interventions because we're not calling them social interventions. So we might have, for example, a study of the number of trees in an area, but not, for example, interviews with households to figure out how important those trees are to them. That's, that's the real problem with environmental rule. It's really about people, but we haven't done the work to understand how people are living in their landscapes. And so that's why we have these large scale failures and pitfalls, potentially. Um, so one of the things then that a lot of um, environmental activities, environmental policies try to do is educate people. Like you ought to use the forest this way, you ought to use water this way. Um, and it's really about changing people's behavior, but because we don't know why people are doing things in the first place, those behavior interventions often fail because we haven't done the work to understand. Um, so one of the things that environmental rule focuses in on is this idea of subjectivities. How are people, how do they become environmental subjects? How do they come to understand that whatever they're doing in the environment is considered not acceptable by whoever whether it's government or NGO or someone else that wants to change their livelihoods or change where they're living and so forth. So how do they themselves come to be environmental subjects? How do they come to understand like, oh, what I'm doing is not producing food, it's deforesting, right? Sometimes people do accept that and they go, oh, okay, I guess I've been told that I'm a danger to the environment and we ought to change our practices. But oftentimes people don't accept that, right? And so they resist these identifications, they're like, you know, it's not deforestation for me to grow crops under forest canopy. That's a long-standing cultural practice. So some people accept the labels, some people don't. Um, and so that's why we get a, a mix of responses um, to environmental policies. Um, and finally, the last step is this network. Like, what does this network do? Um, and so this idea of translation comes from actor network theory, and it's how we actually get people to accept that there needs to be some sort of change. So what are ideas and practices and materials that are moving through these networks and getting people to go, okay, yeah, we really need to, to make some sort of change. So in my book, I look specifically at forest policy. So this is just a diagram to show how this worked, these five steps worked um, in terms of forests themselves. So the first step was always to create the problem, like map forests, um, classify forests in different ways, these are degraded, these are rich, um, and framing what the drivers of forest change are. You know, for example, identifying local people practicing Sweden as a driver, but not, you know, state forest enterprises that are providing revenue to the state. So a very selective way to understand what the drivers are. Then the next step would be to produce knowledge to fit what you've already identified as the problem. So relying on professional foresters to help you 
defined forests, not on the people that are actually using the forests, um, using statistics in a way that shapes what you've already decided to do. Then you intervene. You actually design a forest reserve. You create a logging plan. You make a market for environmental services. Um, you try to encourage people to identify with those interventions themselves to accept, yes, I should change. I should do something differently. So you encourage participation, maybe co-management in your activities. You try to minimize resistance. You want people to accept your change. Um, and then you want to expand the success of your project or your plan, so you rely on translation to enroll other people in your network. Maybe you get the World Bank interested, maybe you get other donors interested. Um, and one of the things that circulates in these networks are the, the actual um, you know, objects that you're working on, things like trees and land tenure certificates. They all become a way to draw more people into your policy. Um, and so it's these steps that really help us understand what um, environmental rule looks like. So in the various chapters of the book, it's basically chronological. And so I start with um, environmental rule in the French colonial period, and I end with um, the current period where forests are really envisioned as places to capture carbon in light of climate change. Um, but the fourth chapter focused specifically on reforestation, and the reason that um, I had a whole chapter just on reforestation is because it's been a very prominent policy in Vietnam. Um, there was a lot of money, billions of dollars, um, spent on trying to um, expand forest cover in Vietnam. And so my argument in this chapter looking at reforestation is that these tree planting projects were not so much about trees, but they were about social objectives. And in particular, tree planting in Vietnam corresponded with a time period, um, decollectivization in particular, where there was a lot of uncertainty about who was going to be managing rural lands. Now that cooperatives had failed and state forest enterprises weren't very financially successful, who was going to manage land? And so reforestation became a way to get individual households enrolled in the idea that they themselves were now responsible, right? It was no longer a cooperative, it was no longer the state, they themselves had to be responsible for making decisions. And so it was really about land, it's about land management, but trees became this, this vehicle to change land management practices. So a lot of the tree planting projects um, that developed over the last 50 years have been, have referred to the important role of Ho Chi Minh himself and saying that, you know, trees are, should be something that everybody participates in, right? We have this um, Tet Chom Kai, this idea that like at New Year's, we should plant trees. This is all part of enrolling environmental subjects in the process of planting trees. You appeal to their patriotism. You say, you know, if you want to be part of our country, you know, Lunar New Year is a time to be, to think about your role in your family, in your country. Um, and so these Lunar New Year tet, um, planting projects um, have planted millions of trees um, over the years. Um, and, you know, later initiatives that were funded by donors really built on this idea. Um, so there was a very large project called the Five Million Hectare Reforestation Project. Um, which occurred from the late 90s um, to about 2010, and it was plant 5 million hectares. Um, it didn't quite meet that goal. Um, but the idea was to take Vietnam back to 1943 in terms of its forest cover. That, to, that was going to be the goal. Um, and so Vietnam ended up planting about 4 million hectares. We, it fell short of its goal. Um, but that was a pretty successful um, approach if you just thought about it in terms of the number of hectares that were planted, right? If that was your goal, okay, you got four million out of five, you know, pretty successful. Um, but if you actually dig into it a little bit deeper, there's where the problem is. Because the trees that were planted um, were, were not really native trees in most cases. They weren't really leading to ecological restoration. 
what happened under these large-scale reforestation projects is it essentially turned large areas of rural Vietnam, particularly in central Vietnam, into acacia plantations, which they are to this day. So it turned areas that were classified as bare hills, um, that tum, into acacia. And smallholders were supposed to plant and care for this acacia. They were going to be the drivers of economic change um, to build up essentially a market. Um, it's a pretty big market for low quality wood. A lot of the acacia goes for wood chips to turn it into, um, it used to be for paper, now it's increasingly for bioenergy in Europe and for um, garden furniture. So not the furniture you would use in your house, but like, you know, people in Europe want to sit in their gardens, okay? So it's fairly low quality timber. Um, but what was interesting about these, these um, projects is they were always called regreening, right? We're gonna regreen these bare hills. Here's what the bare hills look like. Oh, we need to make these look much more like a lush forest. This is, you know, very degraded. We need to change these. So they were always, talked about as in, in ecological terms, but actually when I did my, I did my dissertation research in this area, this is in central Vietnam, Ha Ting, and um, I, would, I did transects to figure out like how many species are in these bare hills, what are they being used for? Um, and so a lot of these bare hills actually, you know, had like 30 different tree species in them but they were completely removed to be planted for acacia. So it went from like a fairly actually diverse system that was called a bare hill to an acacia plantation. Um, and so the, this change, there we go, required people to be involved. And so the way that these new environmental subjects were brought into these tree planting initiatives was to promise people land tenure certificates. And so this was, cooperatives were falling apart at this point, and so the state really needed people to manage land as individual households. And so they were given land tenure certificates in exchange for agreeing to plant trees. Um, and so trees themselves actually became really important actors, um, oops, went ahead, really important actors as well, because these type of trees, so acacia is a tree that um, it has to be planted very densely um, because if, if you don't plant it densely, it doesn't grow straight. And so acacia requires people to actively plant it. You can't just aerial seed it with a plane. You can't just let it grow naturally. You have to go and you have to plant it every seven or eight years and then you harvest it and then you plant it again. So the tree itself required certain types of labor. Um, acacias in particular don't grow if there's competition from other trees. So what this woman here is doing is cutting down all the native vegetation. These are all like native trees that would have eventually grown up into a nice forest, um, but they were all replaced with acacia because you can't have an understory, acacia won't grow. Um, so the trees themselves created this need for households to clear lands, plant acacias, and then wait for those acacias to be turned into wood chips seven years later. And so economically, it's fairly profitable for households. They can make a living from acacia, but ecologically, it's terrible. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of um, environmental benefits from acacia other than some soil stabilization. But in the future of climate change, which Vietnam is facing, acacia is very vulnerable to droughts and to storms. And we know those are gonna be the two things that are gonna hit Vietnam really badly in central Vietnam in the future. So acacia is not a great climate adaptation strategy, unfortunately. So, oh, sorry. Um, so it's not a great climate adaptation strategy. Um, so thinking about these changes that have happened in forests and reforestation um, that I talked about in my book has got me to be thinking more about climate. Like could environmental rule be applied to climate adaptation projects? Um, and I think the answer is yes. Um, and so I've done a little bit of work with some of my students to look at climate adaptation projects in Vietnam. And so kind of applying the steps of environmental rule to adaptation projects, you know, problematizing, you know, what are the most pressing climate impacts? Who's gonna be most vulnerable to climate? You know, thinking about what knowledge are we gonna be producing about climate impacts in Vietnam? 
um, you know, which models are being used to identify which outcomes, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. This was a really big controversy a couple of years ago. Um, some modelers associated um, with Columbia University in the US were making model projections that the Mekong Delta would be you know, basically totally underwater by 2050. And the government of Vietnam really pushed back very hard on those models. Because if you believed those models, why would you invest in development in the Mekong Delta, right? Like if all the land is gonna be gone. So there's a real economic implication to having certain models make certain projections for the future. Um, so then once you have a model that tells you what you want the future to look like, you know, you have to think about, well, how, what, what sort of project would I plan to adapt to that future? What sort of intervention do we need? Um, and then how are the people that are gonna be impacted by climate, what are they supposed to be doing? How do, do they see themselves as vulnerable or not? Um, and then how do narratives of success try to bring more people into funding your adaptation projects, right? Have you had vulnerability reduction? Um, you know, are you able to get more people interested in your climate um, project? So one of the things I've done recently with some of my students is try to classify all the climate adaptation projects that are happening in Vietnam right now um, by what they're doing. This was a couple of years ago, um, but this is projects from Monray, the Ministry of Environment is blue, um, MARD, Ministry of Agriculture is orange, donors are gray, and NGOs are yellow. And you could see the number one funder of adaptation projects in Vietnam is the Ministry of Agriculture. And what they're funding is mostly infrastructure and spatial planning. Um, and so one of the things I, of course, became interested in is like, why is it mostly MARD? And why is MARD funding so many more projects than the Ministry of Environment which is the ministry that's supposed to be dealing with climate change. And the answer, if you actually dig into what MARD is funding, is they're funding everything they wanted to fund before, but they're calling it climate change now. So they're funding irrigation projects, new canals, new water infrastructure, um, and they just call it climate adaptation now. So it's exactly the same thing they wanted to do before, and in some cases it doesn't have anything to do with future climate, um, it's just, you know, they were gonna fund it anyway. And so that's an example of environmental rule. It's like you take climate problems as the justification for why you're funding this project, but it's still the original reasons, like, you know, you wanted to fund more water infrastructure. So then one final example that I wanna give, and then I'll leave some time for questions, is um, one of the ways that um, localities in Vietnam have been thinking about climate adaptation is to resettle um, communities. And that's particularly been the case in the Mekong Delta where there's riverbank erosion. Um, and so you can see this is an example from Anzang. And so there were poor households that were living along the riverbank and they are being resettled to a different part, um, a little bit further outside the city. Well, if you look at it, right, it's like a kind of empty area, and all the people that used to live by the river are losing market access, they, you know, they don't have um, the same access to roads and the new resettlement site, so a lot of folks that are resettled end up just moving back to the riverbank. And the whole reason these projects are being implemented is because of erosion, because of the environmental problem, but in fact, there's very little understanding of why people have settled on the riverbank in, to begin with, right? The reason why they've settled on these riverbanks, right, when you can see the erosion here, is because they're poor to begin with, right? The riverbank didn't make them poor. The reason why they're living there is because they can't afford to live someplace else. And so if you actually started with their uh, pre-existing vulnerability and then you said, oh, okay, well, let's think about how we can um, help them in ways that would um, not force them to move away from where they might have family or markets or their support networks, but we think about something else. Um, and the problem, of course, with erosion as well is one of the reasons wh why there's so much erosion in the Mekong Delta is because of hydroelectric power dams 
further up away from Vietnam, but also sand mining, right? Like people that are coming in and taking all the sand and sending it to Singapore. And so that's causing erosion. So the people that are vulnerable to erosion are not causing the erosion, but they're the ones that are ex expected to move. And so these resettlement programs have been very bad. They've been, a lot of people just move back. Um, they often lose money. They're asked to invest some of their own money in the resettlement site, and then they lose it if they decide to move back to their old location. Um, so part of this is about turning messy landscapes, you know, uh, uh, sort of jagged coastlines and so forth, and turning them into something that's a bit more legible, a bit more engineered. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't address the social vulnerability that created the problem in the first place, like why people are located in um, areas that are um, going to experience climate change. And so if we looked at, at their vulnerability first, that would you know, lead us to make different interventions. But because these interventions are, are labeled as you know, controlling soil erosion, controlling riverbank erosion, we, don't, we, have, we haven't designed around people. Um, and so that's part of the problem. So I'll leave it. I think that's the end there. Yeah. So I'll leave it there. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you to all my uh, research sponsors over the years. Um, and happy to hear about what some of the other projects students here maybe are working on as well. So thanks. Wow, that was um, really like it's, it's short and sweet, but I think it, you 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 had so much really amazing information in there, and um, you know it's, it's it's great that you you've also been you know applying many of these um, sort of uh, uh, insights from your very long study. Um, you know, I, I guess twenty five years uh, in the field uh, of of studying forestry in Vietnam. Um, to very much present day problems. And um, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll just start with a few questions and then maybe our audience uh, here. And then if, if you're online, uh, please feel free to, to type in the comments uh, or, or check those as well um, for, for questions. Uh, so the, the first thing is just something more general, I think for our, our audience, which is, as you can see, mostly students who are really driven and have come here like, the day after holidays, you know, in the two days that, that we're back to 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 listen, um, you know, what kind of skill sets do you see? I think for um, that you would need to study something like this, because one of the things I think that people can see from your book and and from your talk is that you you clearly you know uh, to to a fundamental extent you are a historian, right? Like you work with archives, you. Um, you know, w you look at change over time uh, very seriously, but you're also you know speaking very directly to policy as well, uh, and and I believe you also have um, some training in sort of natural resource management and stuff. And uh, from having had many friends in in the, the Cornell School of Agriculture, I knew that they had to learn things like tree climbing and like how to measure soil and like driving a stake into the ground and like doing all of these survey stuff, right? So I, I guess, yeah, just, just, just to start, like what sort of skills have you had to build up over the years and what sorts of skills um, today and in the future uh, um, do you see, you know, that our students uh, who are interested in these sorts of topics, who are interested in um, environmental um, studies, Right uh, and making a difference, perhaps uh, would would need to to learn. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the one thing I would um, emphasize for folks who want to study environmental problems through this lens, this idea that environmental problems aren't um, problems until somebody labels them and is part of this process of environmental rule, is to really think about multi-method approaches. Um, so I've supervised some master's students um, at Vietnam National University in Hanoi. And one of the um, sort of classic approaches in, in Vietnam is to go collect statistics. And, and mostly you get statistics that somebody else has come up with, maybe a government ministry, and you sort of analyze them, and then you write your thesis. Um, so it's very narrow. And it sort of assumes that those statistics were collected accurately in the first place, which isn't always the case. Um, and so I always tell students that 
that could be one part of your thesis, but that's not everything. You have to kind of dig deeper, and you have to think about, okay, who collected that data? Um, you know, what is the history here? You know, what, what might be some different ways to look at this problem? And so, you know, as you alluded, I'm, I'm actually an anthropologist and a forester by training, but I did work in the archives, so I'm like a pretend historian. Um, because I think that's really important. I think whenever we're talking about environmental change, um, if we just look at what's happening now, we miss out on those ways in which there could be something in the past that created this like path dependency to get us to where we are now. And we have to understand that. So I would encourage, I encourage my own students to have this multi-method approach where they maybe have some historical analysis they do some qualitative work, they interview people in different places, they maybe combine that with quantitative work, um, either statistical analysis or, you know, in my case, you actually go out and you measure the trees, you've got a little tape measure and you figure out, you know, how big are they getting, why are some forests richer than others, um, and you do that sort of work, but you do it in conjunction with different methods. And so the, the real, I don't know, lesson I hope that comes out of this book is that thinking about ecological problems, if you just take that narrow lens, like I'm gonna go measure trees, I am gonna go count the number of species in a forest, that's important, but it's such a narrow slice of what the bigger picture is. Um, and so I always describe what I do as really about the human dimensions of environmental change. And that's, you mentioned I'm doing some work for the UN right now. I mean, that's what we come back to constantly. I work with a lot of natural scientists. And the end, the reason why we have climate change, the reason why we have biodiversity loss, is not because the natural world is doing things, it's because we people are doing things to the natural world. And so it really is about people. It's always about people. And so if we can use different methodologies to understand people and their relationship with the environment, that's, that's what we need. We shouldn't just focus on measuring fish or measuring trees and so forth. We really need to think about that human um, influence on environmental change. And we, use, we do that through multiple methods, either historical or qualitative. Yeah, thank you, and, and I think that's, that's really you know, a great inspiration for many of our students um, today. I think even going forward, um, uh, probably some, I, I think some geo-mapping uh, skills and, and um, maybe even programming skills will be quite important um, uh, in, in bringing all of this stuff together. So just, just looking back at sort of your, your career that's, that's sort of brought you here, I mean, you've, yeah, I mean, today you have you know UN backing, you have you know big um, uh, grants backing, right? Um, and and your your big name professor. You started out in the '90s, right? Coming to these um, national parks in Vietnam, which at the time just like. Now there's more of a trend for I guess the foot like like going uh, the boot, like go, going into the forest trekking and stuff like that right back then this this wasn't like probably on many people's radars and, and you're you know a white American woman in, in Vietnam in like 1996 right um, with with you know a, as an anthropologist going into these spaces and studying these things um, and also later on you're also studying so, and, and and actually I have friends in a Ministry of Agriculture Ministry of Environment that would actually echo many of what you said, uh, and, and even more right, in terms of the sort of tension between these ministries and the sort of back and forth about you know, who manages what and where. Right? So I guess how do you, as, as a researcher, uh, as an ethnographer, I guess, uh, primarily, right, um, enter into these spaces? How, how have you seen sort of research in um, these areas of Vietnam change over time? Are there topics that are that you've found sort of a significant resistance pushback or like just lesser cooperation about, for example, right? Um, so uh, for, for my own sharing, like, it, like I, I've been working with the Stimson Center for some time and they've been uh, exactly like you said, that the, 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 the mapping and the forecasting of Mekong Delta uh, uh, sinking is 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 actually uh, very contentious because you know the Vietnamese government doesn't uh, is is worried about a certain uh, outlook, but then 
you know, we also want an accurate <laughs> understanding of when things actually go down. So, um, you know, it can't be like the Titanic saying it will <laughs> float forever, right? Um, so, yeah, it's just, just, you know, what, what, what sorts of challenges have you had in these spaces? Yeah, I mean, to start with the, the end point, you know, the challenge of forecasting environmental change, I think part of the controversy over these forecasts of Mekong Delta futures is they're often made by researchers who are using satellite and LIDAR imagery um, and they're not involving re Vietnamese research institutions because you can do a lot of that modeling work you know, from the Netherlands or someplace else. You don't actually have to be here on the ground um, for some of these models. And that's been part of the problem because they don't have folks on the ground that either are working closely on these research projects so they sort of understand the, the pros and cons of different models. I mean, all models are flawed, right? But some are more flawed than others. And so you wanna understand where models have strengths and where they have weaknesses, right? And the weaknesses are often around, um, particularly in climate adaptation, a lot of our climate forecasts do a terrible job of forecasting what people themselves can do to adapt. And so your future of you know, Mekong Delta, sea level rise, and, and all these other sort of dire, terrible things in the future don't include any adaptation measures that people can take starting now, right? And so you have to understand that that's a weakness. And so the models will often show you a future that looks worse than what's probably gonna happen because they, they can't incorporate sort of human ingenuity and, and different approaches to adaptation. And, and so if there was better cooperation, I mean, it drives me crazy to see um, research groups based in Europe and based in the United States publishing on the Mekong Delta and not a single author in their list of authors is Vietnamese. That drives me crazy um, because you know, you, you need that sort of local partnership to get the on the ground situation and to really understand it and to understand what the consequences of these models are for real living people on the ground. Um, and so I think better cooperative arrangements around research is like a huge priority and it's something I've been trying to do more in my work and some of my research projects um, is to ensure that, you know, I'm co-publishing with my Vietnamese colleagues and there's a sort of buy-in um, that this isn't just like me, the white woman from America flying in and getting all my data and flying away. Um, and so I, I think we need more of that. Like we need a lot more of that and a better way to do that. And I think that would help us um, improve capacity here in Vietnam, but also improve the long-term models <laughs> and the long-term policies for climate change. Um, and so that's why I think it's really important for students to be thinking about like, oh, are there research projects that I could get involved in and I could you know, help um, understand what the limitations are here and, and what are the policy consequences of some of this work? Um, and I used to say that environmental um, studies in Vietnam um, were, were good to do because they weren't sensitive um, and it was pretty easy to get research permission. I have to say that has changed. Um, that has changed. And so environmental problems are sensitive now. And so they're sensitive in the sense that like this political question about, you know, Mekong Delta futures, you know, that has policy consequences to say that the Mekong Delta is gonna be underwater. Um, but I would say some of the other climate issues are also sensitive, particularly around changing the energy mix of Vietnam. Um, you know, Vietnam has coal production, particularly in the Northeast, and there are a lot of um, people who benefit from coal production. And so there's, even though Vietnam has pledged to be net zero, you know, the Prime Minister pledged this two years ago at the big climate conference, um, the transition itself is gonna be challenging. And so that can be sensitive to talk about that transition. Um, and so just to be aware that environmental issues are not politically neutral. Um, I mean, that was the, the point of the book as well. Um, so just sort of navigate those and understand what those sensitivities are. But I think it's, it's an exciting field, um, particularly because Vietnam is really a bellwether. Like it's the, you know, as we say, the canary in the coal mine. Like what happens in Vietnam in terms of climate change, it's what's gonna happen every place else in the world. 
right? You've got sea level rise, you've got um, water salinity issues, you've got coastal erosion issues, you've got urbanization pressures, you've got you know urban heat island with so many people in, in big cities. Every, every problem that we could possibly imagine that goes along with climate change is in Vietnam, every single one. And so it's gonna really require people with that expertise to help Vietnam manage that transition, that adaptation process. Um, so it's an exciting field, but just be aware that there are some political sensitivities around you know, energy and a few other things that, that are, um, are important to pay attention to. Yeah, I, um, I, when uh, you know the the Stimson team was working with the Ministry of uh, Environment, actually one of the difficult things was they they understood that the the rate the uh, satellite data may not be enough, and they they actually want better maps from the Vietnamese side, but to a certain resolution, actually the Vietnamese side cannot provide those maps. The actually state secrets, because if you have certain kinds of topographical maps, you can actually invade a country. <laughs> um, it's actually necessary for national defense. <laughs> um, so it's a very, very interesting sort of uh, area. But yeah, it, it's, it's amazing the amount of great work you've done and, and been able to, uh, I'm sure, like forge connections in, in a time when it was very difficult even at first and, and even now. So yeah, I just want to turn uh, it over to, to the audience to, to uh, if you have any, any questions about this project, about uh, Pam's next project as well, <laughs> potentially. Uh, which, yeah, Tae Chung, please. Um, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. And we'll ask first, and maybe you will think about your questions later. Um, uh, in, in your book, you mentioned about the actor network theory, and you uh, emphasized the power of knowledge. And you also uh, say that uh, Vietnam is like the canary in the, in the coal mine. What happens in Vietnam can happen elsewhere later. So, uh, so I, I wonder about the knowledge, because in Vietnam, it, especially in the Mekong River Delta, when I talk to the experts out there, they often talk about the, the notion of thuận thiên, uh, to live with the nature, uh, the nature and then uh, we should use the local knowledge and to live with the nature, not like uh, the government intervention, like say, building the dam. And, and I think that uh, living with the nature is the best uh, solution right now. So when we talk about the power of knowledge, and so I wonder what, what, what the knowledge is right now, because is it like something like universal knowledge? Because what happened in Vietnam can happen, happen elsewhere. And what is considered the benchmark for intervention is what you said, like uh, uh, we, we, we can uh, diffuse the knowledge and then we can uh, have some kind of intervention into the policy in Vietnam. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm a political scientist, not a, uh, an anthropologist. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a lot more interest in Vietnam now about local knowledge and, and globally about indigenous and local knowledge. Um, but the Mekong Delta is a great example because you know people there for so long have said things like living together with the floods, right? Like some chung boy lut. But but the problem is that there have been so many interventions in the water system that it's not living together with the floods anymore. It's trying to stop the floods. Um, but in trying to stop the floods, we've actually created new vulnerabilities. So a great example of this is um, all of the, the dikes, right? They're called the August dikes because they're engineered to hold back the floodwaters until August so that farmers can do three crops of rice, right? Instead of two or just one, right? So it's been very food security focused. But when you build those high dikes, it actually makes the water that comes naturally during the flood season, it sort of channels it so it goes faster. So it's more erosive. Um, if there's excess rain, it makes those floods overtop the dikes. So there's sort of a false sense of protection. Um, so the, the, the prior strategies that farmers might have had, which is, okay, if we have a really rainy season this year, I might plant a different variety of rice that's gonna ripen a little bit early and then I'll, I'll shift to do more like um, fish production in, in my flooded paddy field. Like that's gonna be my strategy with my local knowledge this year. You can't do that anymore, 
if you're living in an area with those high dikes because you're not going to get fish in your field. The fish can't flow through the dike, right? They can't do it anymore. And so local knowledge is important, but it's been constricted by the agricultural development that's been very top-down and food security focused. Now, I think things are changing. A lot of the local areas are saying, you know, we're not going to focus on three crop rice anymore because it's vulnerable to climate change. It's actually pretty low value. There's other things that we can be doing. And so I'm, I, I think I'm optimistic that there's going to be more focus on like these nature-based solutions, right? Like using local knowledge, you know, mangrove uh, protection with shrimp cultivation together, right, is a good example of that. Like you use nature, those mangroves help protect against soil erosion, um, and they enable you to have a decent uh, crop of shrimp that you can sell. Um, so those sorts of interventions that recognize flood regimes, natural ecosystems like wetlands and mangroves, they're, they're becoming very popular globally. Like there's so much talk about nature-based solutions everywhere. So, I mean, Vietnam has a lot of great examples of those, if we can kind of go back to that and away from this like engineering approach. Like I mentioned MARD, you know, they like, they want to make new canals. They want to like dig things up and build things, you know, like really expensive projects. But a lot of these nature-based approaches like restoring wetlands and encouraging fish production in fields, they're very low tech. They don't require a lot of money. I mean, part of the reason why MARD likes these projects is because, you know, it's a lot of money <laughs> coming in, but you don't necessarily need that. You could rely more on local knowledge and nature to help you adapt um, much more than has been the case. So I'm, I'm optimistic that there's going to be more and more of that because I think Vietnam has a real history of that. If we could just sort of get back to it, um, I think there's a lot of good lessons. Um, thank you so much for a really insightful presentation. Um, so I'm sorry if my question is a bit niche, but I noticed uh, on one of your slides uh, you say one of the modes of translation was payment for ecosystem services. Um, and I was just wondering if you could provide like a case in point to demonstrate the tensions with um, you know circulating material forms like payment of ecosystems, like the green regreening example. And um, a further question is that how do you think about like the extent of having quantification of uh, ecological value actually inform um, good climate ad adaptation policies? Yeah, that's another great question. So it's been um, very common to think about ecosystem services in terms of they provide benefits to people. Um, and in fact, you know, Vietnam has a payments for ecosystem services policy, which is focused on forests. And so in my book, I talk about that policy a little bit, where um, the idea is that if we pay people to conserve forests, that we'll um, be able to preserve them better. So it's, you know, in theory, I think it's a great idea. Like people who um, are, you know, living in mountainous areas, they have an incentive to do more forest protection. but. In reality, they're not the drivers of forest loss, right? That oftentimes the drivers of forest loss in Vietnam are large-scale companies. Um, I mean, there's some people here in Ho Chi Minh City who got really, really wealthy based on cutting all the timber in the Central Highlands down. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> um, and so how can you pay local people to protect the forest when the reason why it's getting cut down is a company that's headquartered someplace else that they have no control over, right? So in theory, thinking about ecosystem services works. In reality, it's much more complicated. And so one of the things I talk about in my environmental rule book is to say, you know, identifying the problem as, okay, we're losing forests because they're not economically valued, and so therefore we ought to have this payment for ecosystem services policy. It's like, okay, I actually disagree with the beginning part of that, which is we're losing forests because they're not valued. No, you're losing forests because they are valued. They're valued for timber, but not all the other things that you get. And even with the ecosystem services policy, 
if I'm a company that's gonna get really rich from timber, and then maybe local people will get like this much money from watershed payments. I mean, the amount of money that people get from the policy is like maybe at the maximum, like three million dong per year, right? It's not very much versus a company that's gonna get like hundreds of thousands of dollars from um, cutting down timber. So the, the, the disparity is very big. Um, but that's a great example of like somebody, and actually it was USAID that was really interested in payments for environmental services in Vietnam. They're the, the kind of driving force um, about two decades ago. But they sort of identified the problem as like, we are not valuing all the multiple benefits from forests, which I agree with. But the solution was not to then say, okay, so the people that are then the main drivers, let's put them in jail, right? Let's make, let's actually enforce laws that are on the books um, that you're not supposed to cut down in natural forests, that you're not supposed to be an illegal logger. Like that could have been one strategy, but we didn't do that. We instead said, well, we'll send some payments to local people and they'll be able to protect forests better. And I think, you know, in, as a social policy, it's actually been not bad because it's transferred money um, to poor areas of the uplands in particular from water users. So like in Hanoi, you know, I get my water bill, it has a little extra payment. We all, we all pay if we're living in a watershed um, where we're either using domestic water or we're getting our electricity from hydropower. Um, so all of the consumers pay a little bit extra and then that money gets collected and it gets sent to poor areas. So, you know, three million dong per year for a poor household is, is not bad, right? It's like school fees, it's, you know, maybe some gas, I mean, it's not gonna make you rich, but it's a social support policy in some ways. Um, but the ecological benefits are pretty minimal um, because it's not really focused on the key drivers of forest loss. Um, and, you know, when I've talked to people at the Ministry of Agriculture, they'll say, you know, we, we're continuing to have forest loss. Um, the one thing it's gotten, the one thing that's been a little bit more beneficial is um, there's better relationships between state forests and local people because of those transfers of payments. So there's a little bit less conflict. There's a little bit less um, sort of deliberate, um, um, like things like arson and people going into state forests because they were in conflict with them. Um, but the overall benefits have not really um, created as much ecological um, restoration, for example, as maybe we need in Vietnam, right? So it's a great example of, you know, it's, it's a policy that maybe was problematized in the wrong way. Um, and if we thought about what is the real driver of forest loss, we might not have focused so much on ecosystem services and maybe on other things. But it was politically easier <laughs> to deal with you know, local people and give them a little bit more money than to say, okay, well, actually, you know, really rich guy, you know, who owns a soccer club, <laughs> you know, like, you, you caused the problem. <laughs> so, right, like, those are politically sensitive. So, yeah, so you can see why we choose one path and not the other. So. Um, thank you for coming to our school today and sharing a very insightful presentation. So I wonder, um, speaking of afforestation, it is also famous for uh, that kind of social program in China. And China is also reforesting the, the Gobi Desert. And they also, I think they share several ca characteristics with the, the Bear Hill in uh, Vietnam. So I wonder, is this something Vietnam learned from China, or is there any relationship between the two countries in exchanging those ideas? Uh, uh, and also my second question is regarding sensitivity, researching about um, climate change or coal mining or um, yeah, environmental issues. Uh, did you encounter any difficulties while you, con while you conduct into the field? Um, so that's my two main questions. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say most of Vietnam's work on reforestation um, has really mostly made reference to Vietnam. Like there hasn't been direct lessons from China. Um, but Vietnam is not alone in, in the approach that it took to reforestation, which is relying on really fast growing trees. 
Um, so China has done some of that. Um, there's also a huge project now in Africa, the Great Green Wall, to prevent desertification, um, but also relying on kind of planting fast-growing trees. So this is, this is a very common theme, that, right? Vietnam is not the only one facing this. Um, what Vietnam did that I think is fairly unique is um, combine reforestation with the building of this fairly large sector of the economy, at least in central Vietnam, about exporting the timber. And that hasn't been as much of a focus in China or Africa, right? Vietnam's strategy was really to simultaneously plant more trees, but to build up an export economy around low value wood. Um, and it's worth a lot now, right? And we're talking about billions in export value now. It's, it's pretty significant. Um, so that's been a very unique Vietnamese path. Um, I don't see some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, trying to um, take Vietnam's place in terms of uh, you know, uh, wood market or anything. Um, but the, the, the Vietnam case is really unique because um, I suspect if, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture way back in the 1990s had said, you know, we have this plan to build Vietnam into this booming export economy, they probably would not have gotten as much support from a lot of environmental NGOs as they did, but they kept calling it regreening, right? They're like, we're regreening, we're regreening the bare hills, we're expanding forest cover. It was always called environmental, when in fact it was really an industrial economic policy. They probably would not have had as many people in the network for that. And so the China example is very similar in the sense that a lot of um, um, NGOs uh, focused on environment have also been involved in the China policy. Um, and so they've got this approach um, called ecological redlining to um, identify areas of high value that they want to um, try to manage for ecosystem services. Um, so it, it's very much cast in these environmental terms, right? So that, that part is similar to Vietnam. Um, but it also has had, I think, some impacts that are not, um, that have been very sensitive within China because the approach has been to, very much like Vietnam's payment for ecosystem services policy is to substitute money for um, growing agricultural crops, right? So you plant trees, you can't grow rice, you can't grow corn anymore, you've got to, you know, just have the trees there. Um, and so I think there hasn't been as much attention in China that that has actually had some pretty serious economic impacts. Um, and it's actually been a major driver of migration um, in a few studies that I've seen that have looked at this, um, where you had a strong focus on this ecological restoration and tree planting, you also got a lot of farmers who could no longer live on just the forestry subsidies and they ended up migrating to cities. You don't see that as much in Vietnam, so that's that's different. Um, but but because it was so sort of strictly applied and and you know just for various reasons, the, the, the outcome in China has been a bit different. Um, but it's been controversial um, to even talk about that, to say that like there are social consequences from this reforestation policy. I mean, it's very likely that the authorities probably knew that there would be a lot of migration as a result of it, and that was probably a direct um, hope, right, to move people into cities, potentially, right, to, to turn rural areas into large-scale forests that people don't live in, right, and move them into cities, right, where they can be sort of monitored and managed and, you know, they're contributing to work in factories and all these other things that, that China has had their um, economic policy focused in on. So it was probably a very deliberate hope that that's what would happen, and in, indeed that is what's happened. So that's different. So that part is different from Vietnam. Um, but the, the second part of your question about sensitivities, um, yeah, I mean, every time that I come here, I always have to ask for permission to do work, and sometimes it's granted, sometimes it's not. Um, and, it, and it changes as to what things are sensitive. like. It used to be in the past if I worked on mangrove areas, like those were much less sensitive than border mountainous areas. Now coastal areas are very sensitive, um, particularly because of the sort of tensions with China around, um, you know, rights to the sea and so forth. 
Um, so much more attention, to, particularly for foreigners, less so for Vietnamese, but foreigners who want to research in coastal areas, I never used to have a problem, and now like there's an extra layer of sort of checking, like what are you doing, why are you <laughs> running around the mangroves? Um, so it can shift, it can shift a lot. Um, and sometimes it's, it makes no sense, it's just like, <laughs> who knows what's going on? Um, you know, maybe a local uh, you know, district officer has done something he doesn't want somebody else to discover, and so they just say, you can't do research here. So you have to be flexible is, is the main thing I've learned. It's like, if you have your heart set on doing research in one place and it gets denied, you always have to have a backup. You have to go someplace else and, yeah, just be flexible. Okay. Uh, I should say these are very, very practical um, also tips that you've made. And I, I should say that the, the two students who, who just asked questions both have done amazing work on environmental um, uh, issues. Uh, recently, uh, LAM's been doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, reporting for international news organizations on, on the mangroves, uh, Gunzo and, and other places, and Hank's been working on sort of uh, flooding in some districts of Ho Chi Minh City and, and, and how people adapt to those. So, so um, you know, this is, this is great. Doug, go ahead. So, uh um, so like a bit of um, so my family is in the kind of like power management functionary in Vietnam, and uh, I have to say that they don't like the the idea of forestation. <laughs> um, like a lot of the kind of ideas about forestation and agriculture of Vietnam doesn't resonate with the industrialization of the country. Like the the for example the 500 kilovolt kind of uh, national electric line it had been like a huge deforestation in a lot of area to build that line. Um, and, and also the local government, like they don't, they also like, don't feel like the national agriculture policy sometimes resonate with their situation. And be previously it's been industrialization, now it's been tourism. You see like Sun Group, Vin Group building a lot of like stuff on, you know, Bana and all of that. So I also like how forestation is really rank position in the kind of like the agenda of the government beh behind things like tourism development and uh, industrialization. Yeah, I would say the, the forestry policy that developed in the 90s, uh, particularly around afforestation, was very much focused on improving agricultural production as well, right? So if you have forests in the highlands, then you have more soil stabilization, you have maybe some wind breaks along the coast, but it's, but it's all in service of continuing to have rich agriculture in the other areas. But as Vietnam has moved away from agriculture, then you start to get these conflicts, right? You get local areas that maybe planted mangroves 20 years ago, um, but now realize that like, oh, this coastal area could have been a industrial zone but now it's mangrove. Well, maybe I want to actually cut down the mangrove and turn it into an industrial zone. This is happening actually right now at one of my field sites um, in Taiping, where um, there was a big Danida project um, 1995, so more than 25 years ago, um, almost 30 years ago, replanting all the mangroves, real focus on coastal protection, um, uh, there's a lot of rice, where well, there used to be rice production there, so the coastal protection was aimed at trying to reduce salinity at the, in the inshore agricultural zone. Um, now almost nobody produces rice there anymore because the soil is too saline. Um, uh, most of it is around uh, going out to see fishing or doing shrimp. Um, but the local authorities would like to turn it into an industrial zone. Like they would like to attract shoe factories and, and you know, other investment. And there's a new policy from Hanoi to encourage development along the coast. And so the local district officials in this place in Taiping are going to convert a mangrove into a shoe factory. Um, that's their plan. Um, and the problem is their mangrove is part of a biosphere reserve which is recognized by UNESCO. And so they have some limits, they're not supposed to do that. Um, and so you get this direct clash between you know, a pathway of economic development and what they agreed to do 
more focused on ecotourism and, and nature-based development. Um, I will say the, the, the sort of vision that Vietnam would be a great ecotourism place um, has been hard, particularly since COVID, right? Everything closed down for a couple of years. I think there's a lot more domestic tourism that's sort of untapped, you know, you know going up and getting on your motorbike and defook and all of these things that we didn't have a while ago. Um, so I think that your generation is much more interested in like going camping and enjoying nature and getting out of cities than, you know, maybe your parents were, your grandparents who weren't, you know, they wouldn't want to go camping. <laughs> that doesn't sound like fun. Um, so I think some areas will, will be able to benefit from that, but other areas are like, we're not going to make enough money from that. That's not, you know, we want to attract jobs and so we are going to try to get more factories. We're going to try to get something else, you know, but that's not, that's not a situation that Vietnam alone has to deal with. Like every country has to deal with these competing pressures. Um, I would say the one thing that Vietnam needs to do better though is if, if this district in Taiping cuts down their mangroves and tries to put in the shoe factory and the golf course, which is what they're trying to do, um, it's, it's gonna last maybe 10 years because <laughs> the, the future forecast for climate change are that, you know, that golf course is not gonna be able to grow turf grass anymore because it's gonna be totally sandy and saline. And so you really need to keep the mangroves and you need to develop your shoe factory further inland. So I, I, I'm hopeful that more people working on climate change will help local authorities see, like, you can't just make a decision on what you want now. You have to think about what this is gonna look like in 10 or 20 years. And people aren't really doing that because the political terms are so short, right? Like five years, you're people's chairman for maybe five or 10 years. And so getting people to think about that 20 year forecast is a little bit harder, but I think we have to do it because we're gonna be making bad decisions now about attracting certain types of development that's gonna be really vulnerable to climate change, which is along coastal areas in particular. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Pamela, for sharing um, some of your very profound knowledge and experiences. So speaking of the story of uh, the mangrove and shoe factory in Taiwan, um, I would like to ask a more general questions regarding um, a bit, it does touch on um, a political aspect, but so let's say, for example, if there's a forest, right, and what does it take to, for people to just go there and cut down trees. Um, for example, the trees over there or trees um, along the national highway. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering why does, why is it even possible in the first place to do that? I mean, this was a few years ago now, so it was before um, your time a little bit, but if you remember in Hanoi, about 2015, the, um, you may have heard this story, the story, the local city government decided to cut down a bunch of the old trees in Hanoi. And the reason why they decided to do it is like, the trees were old and they were ugly and we should plant new trees that, that it will be more beautiful and you know not grow up under the sidewalks and you know, not look unsightly. So we're gonna clean everything up, we're gonna cut down the old trees and put new, new ones in, right? Um, and people were so angry. They were so angry. And so you had, you know, school children, professors, um, uh, you know, uh, monks from the pagodas going out and like tying ribbons around all the trees and putting on signs that say, don't kill me, you know, I'm a healthy tree, why, you know. And so there was all this protest around cutting down trees. Um, and so the Hanoi government stopped, right? They finally decided, okay, yeah, we didn't really think that through very well, and that people have a, um, you know, particularly in cities, Vietnam has one of the lowest um, percentages of green space and street trees for urban areas in the world, right? It's really low. There should be more, because people get a lot of benefits from them, right? The trees help reduce heat in cities. Um, you know, they can provide protection against, you know, river erosion and lakes and so forth. So Vietnam cities need more trees. And I think there's interest in doing that from people, but maybe not authorities, right? Because if you plan a, you know, a city park, that's money you can't get from a new 
high-rise development. So there's these economic pressures that are pushing people away from um, supporting trees. Um, and there's still a lot of really poor people in Vietnam as well, right? I mean, it's growing fast, but um, there's still a lot of like, you know, folks that are sort of thinking short term, like I, I need to feed my family, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna cut this down, I'm gonna log. You know, I interviewed a lot of illegal, illegal loggers for my book about like, why, why are you in these forests cutting down trees? Um, and for a lot of people who are at the sort of low level, right, they were doing it for not very much money, but they always sold it to somebody richer, right? It was like the guy, it was like the mafia, the guy at the top who was like ordering, like, you know, go get these rich trees. And he was the one that was making all the money. And the people on the ground, you know, were getting, you know, like maybe 100,000 dong for, you know, a, 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 a tree that would sell for many millions of dong. Um, and so there's that sort of disparity that still drives some people to, um, you know, go into forests and cut down. But I don't think it's the major driver in Vietnam. It's really the sort of high-level connections. Oftentimes it's politicians. There have been a, some really big scandals that, you know, the people that were in charge of a national park were actually the ones that <laughs> were running the operation to cut down all the trees in the national park. There have been a few of those cases. Some of those people are in jail now. Um, Right, so people have different motivations. Um, but I would say like in cities in particular, I see much more support for expanding trees and green space rather than getting rid of it um, because it improves the quality of life and people recognize that. So I'm hopeful that that'll be, I don't know, that city governments will listen to that more. I mean, they, they, they seem to be in Hanoi listening to it a little bit. I hope they are here as well. But yeah, it definitely improves the quality of life when you have opportunities. For, for enjoying green space. Yeah, thank you, Pam, for 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 these reflections. I mean, uh, having the the incredible um, privilege of uh, getting to listen to you today, to dialogue with you, with the students, uh, while looking out that window there, to uh, and and these are these are not this is not original growth, right? These are replanted when. Um, you know when Fumi Hung became rich, right? And 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 I mean you you understand it's exactly the point that you that you raised, right? Economic disparity. The rich do want trees. The rich do understand very well <laughs> that trees, you know, um, if you can make the space for them, it's going to improve, you know, not just your quality of life, but also just your your pockets, right? Like your um, the property values, <laughs> right, in this whole area, for sure. Right. Um, this is something I think that that as you write in the book, you know, is very deep. It's partly, you know, um, one of the sort of maybe positive side effects of, of the governmentality, right? That is, it's been put deep in Vietnamese people's minds. This idea of the need of environmental protection is one of the few issues that people can do public activism. I mean, online and also even in the street in Vietnam, it's like for almost nothing else can you do, you know, on the street activism, right? But environment is where you can, right? And the government has actually, you know, sort of leaned in and it allowed some of it and bent to it, you know, local governments. Have, so, so um, you know, I, I, th I think it's, it's been, you know, it's been a really great talk. There's a, there's a lot, I think, to, to still reflect upon um, for, for us. And thank you so much, Pam, for, for coming here uh, physically to us, uh, um, for, for offering your, your book to, to the library. We, we hope uh, to also collect your second one very soon. Uh, I, I believe you have some flyers here. The, and 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 they they are they are little fly they're little flyers for the book but they they uh, but then you you get to to see what what the book's about uh, right and and you, please please do check out the book in in the library um, um, and and uh, you know as as uh, th thank you also for that idea you said earlier that you know um, many international organizations and researchers would like to have partners in Vietnam. I want to say that Fulbright sh should always hope to be such a partner, uh, first in terms of facilitating research um, in whichever way we can for, for visiting researchers, second in uh, you know, collaborative efforts if you need feet on the ground, you know, if you need uh, 
really energized students who would come like a day after the big holidays uh, uh, on the ground. I mean, this is a bigger crowd than I think you may get at, in many places. I'm sure you pull many people, but like this is still a pretty good crowd, right? Um, so, so and, and I'm sure many of these students would love for any opportunities that you may have um, in terms of, you know, uh, UN projects or you know, um, other grants, projects that, that, um, that you have uh, for them to participate. So um, with that, I just want to say again, thank you so much for the IT team for, for coming uh, in today. Thanks, uh, everyone. And, and last words to you, Pam. Uh, yeah, um, if, if you want to say anything to end. Yeah. yeah, no, just thank you so much for having me here. And it's been a pleasure to talk with all of you. And I hope to hear from you about your own projects and stay in touch for the future. So thank you and thank you.